Okay. Good, lovely, and I see so many names, so wonderful. So welcome everybody. And I'm very, very happy, very pleased to have Professor Dominik Stöckinger from Dresden here as our guest today. And he is an, uh, uh, one of the great experts on the G-2 and BSM field. And so I'm very happy that you could uh, come uh, virtually <laughs> today and give the lecture. And uh, Dominic is, um, we have been so many times together, we have a long time, and we have even been together here at DAISY in our postdoc time. And I believe one can really say that uh, Georg and Sven volunteered Dominic to start really with the G minus two calculations and become now the world expert on this field. So that has, so to say, the starting point was, so to say, also at DAISY. Can we say it like this? In some sense, yes. Now, nah, wonderful. So then please, now the stage is yours. Please start and um, we're looking forward to your lovely talk. Okay, thank you very much, Rudi, and thanks to everybody for this invitation. Let me share the screen. So you should now be able to see the screen. And um, okay, thanks a lot. We have three hours of lectures on muon G minus two and the particular focus is on possible beyond the standard model explanations of the result of the G minus two experiment at Fermilab. Let's begin. Um, I assume that most or all of you have seen this plot, which is the final result of the Fermilab G minus two uh, run one uh, uh, measurement. As you know, this has been published in April, so not very long ago. And the first and very important fact about this result is that the Fermilab G minus two run one uh, agrees really perfectly well with the previous result from the Brookhaven G minus two measurement, which had been done 20 years earlier. And um, so the agreement is better than one sigma and uh, you see that the uh, experimental error bars agree very well and uh, the central values um, confirm each other. And so after all this progress on the experimental side, after all the preparation of the experiment and the data taking and the analysis, now we have a very solid experimental result once again. And uh, we have a 4.2 sigma deviation from the standard model prediction. And that is uh, what we are here for, because we will ask which models can explain potentially this uh, discrepancy and maybe which models cannot explain it. In other words, uh, this is a very interesting indication for physics beyond the standard model and um, many theories or hypoth hypothetical possibilities are strongly constrained by it. As you know, there is also a um, standard model calculation based on the BMW lattice result, which I will not really focus on in these lectures. And um, this just highlights the fact that, of course, this uh, plot here is a snapshot. It is a current snapshot of the um, uh, theory initiative uh, standard model prediction in the current Fermilab run one data. And uh, this is the first run of the Fermilab measurement and uh, there will be further runs and the standard model prediction will also improve in the next years. So we will not, uh, we will see how it will develop, but for now we want to interpret this 4.2 sigma deviation. So which models can explain it? Here is in one slide the answer. So these are all the plots from our paper and uh, there are around 100 additional papers with many, many more plots. And so uh, there are many, many potential explana explanations. And as you see here in some of the red areas in some of the plots, uh, not all models can explain this deviation. And um, we will go through some of those plots, but actually um, as an outlook for the lecture, what I will particularly for all the individual details of the plots, but I will really try to explain to you particularly general ideas and general concepts so that you are able to understand um, the generic features of G minus two, why it is important for physics beyond the standard model and what we can learn in general from it, and uh, which might also help you in navigating through the literature on, on this field. Okay, so this is the outline of today's lecture. 
I will begin with a brief motivation and further introduction. Then, um, in general, I will try to do it as a kind of mix uh, between, let's say, really serious lecture style elements where I will explain and derive formulas. And um, uh, so, so here we will in particular then give a accurate definition of G minus two and um, derive um, uh, required um, uh, results. But I will also interleave it with a few pictorial explanations and colloquium style explanations to maybe keep your attention awake. And uh, please feel free to interrupt also with questions if you have any or comments. So that is absolutely no problem. So, uh, okay, then after uh, having defined all these important formulas, I will give a brief review on the standard model prediction and also the experimental situation, even though this is not the primary focus of the lecture. And I assume that you have seen uh, dedicated talks on this also in Hamburg. Then um, I will turn to G minus two and physics beyond the standard model. First, in more general terms, I will give a motivation of the field. And um, then I will give you two of those general remarks, which I think are really important to understand the general literature and the general kind of concepts, what you should have in mind in uh, thinking of G minus two and physics beyond the standard model. And then we come to a core topic of the entire lecture series, maybe the single most important aspect of G minus two theory um, from BSM point of view is the chirality flips. And so I will um, in detail uh, explain what they are and how they are connected to G minus two and how thinking about chirality flips helps us understand uh, the situation. Okay, let's motivate ourselves. Why are G factors so interesting and how did we get here to this current 4.2 sigma deviation? I like to show this comparison of three fermion G factors for the electron, muon, and the proton. So you see here that the electron and muon G factors are approximately two, but not quite exactly two. There is this uh, interesting deviation G minus two and uh, just to not forget it, what we are often talking about is A mu, the anomaly, which is G minus two divided by two. So, okay, so from this, you see that in the electron and the muon case, this A mu is a one per mil effect. And you see that for the proton, G minus two is a more than 100% effect. So, okay, so you, you see from this, that G factors are directly a very simple, but very deep probe of the fundamental structure of elementary particles. So you can imagine uh, yourself at a time where the muon was discovered. Initially, it was not known what kind of particle the muon is. Is it similar to the electron or is it similar to the proton or similar to a charged pion? But just by looking at the chief factor, you see immediately that the muon is very, very closely related to the electron. And of course, we now know that it is a second generation lepton, so a heavy sibling of the electron. And you can see this directly from the comparison of the G factors. And for the proton, of course, G minus two is a 200% effect almost because it's a strongly interacting bound state. Whereas the electron and the muon are perturbatively described objects where uh, these quantum fluctuations, which give rise to G minus two um, come from QED and are of the order alpha. Okay, then by going deeper, you see also that the electron and the muon G factors are not exactly the same, but they start to differ at the fifth or sixth digit. And this difference is a reflection of the fact that the muon is more sensitive to quantum fluctuations from heavy particles. And that is why its G factor is a little bit larger. And that also uh, is a reflection of the fact that the muon is more sensitive to potential BSM contributions. And uh, that is why it is more interesting for us to discuss the muon G minus two than the electron G minus two. So in fact, as we will see later, and as you certainly know, G minus two uh, of the muon really probes the quantum structure of all interactions in the standard model and potentially beyond the standard model. So uh, just a brief history, the muon was discovered in the 50s and then uh, its G factor was first measured in 1957. 
and it was uh, observed to be approximately equal to two, as we saw on the previous slide. And this was a fundamentally important result because already there it made clear that the muon is essentially a Dirac particle like the electron. Then uh, there was a series of G minus two measurements at CERN in the 60s and 70s. And ultimately um, they asked a very interesting question at the CERN experiment, namely they asked, are there strongly interacting contributions to the muon G minus two, uh, yes or no? And so they compared uh, or derived two theory predictions. Uh, one theory prediction that you see here on the left, by the way, do you see my mouse pointer? Okay, yes. uh, so um, you see here the uh, theory prediction without hadronic effects or without strong interactions and another theory prediction with strong interactions. And you see that perfectly uh, uh, the experiment agrees with a prediction which includes strong interactions while the other one is excluded by eight sigma significance. And so uh, the outcome of the CERN experiment was really that um, strong interactions affect Dominic, Dominic hi, can I ask a question quick here? Oh, this is Sven. Okay. Oh, yeah. okay. When you say uh, strong interaction, you refer to quarks interacting or you really refer to the strong coupling entering? Well, uh, yeah, quarks. So in, in fact, uh, hadronic contributions would be the right thing to say. But okay. of course, yeah. elementary quarks are uh, not sufficient to describe this at all, as you know. So uh, yeah. Okay, thanks. But mm -hmm. we are talking about the hadronic contributions, hadronic vacuum polarization to be precise. Right, and then of course uh, at Brookhaven 20 years later, um, they asked uh, the question, how about weak interactions? Do they also contribute to G minus two of the muon? And then again, one derived two theory predictions without weak interactions and with weak interactions. But you see uh, both of them disagree with a Brookhaven measurement. And so that was the tantalizing deviation, the, the legacy of the Brookhaven experiment, uh, that neither of the two predictions, um, in particular, not a full one, with, which includes everything we know about the standard model, agreed with a Brookhaven result. And at the time of the Brookhaven publication, this was around a three sigma deviation. Currently, it's a little bit more than three sigma and um, uh, together with Fermilab, we now have four sigma deviation. So that was the result from Brookhaven. And because of that, of course, uh, the community was motivated to improve the measurement and uh, the Brookhaven ring was transported to Fermilab using this nice way. And you see here some photographs. And in 2017, then finally the experiment started and the first data taking run was performed in uh, 2017 and 18. And that is the analysis that has now been published in April. And um, uh, as you may know, may, yeah? may I ask one, one question? So originally the original Brookhaven experiment at the time uh, was planned to run for, I think, another year or another two years, but it was cut uh, early because of budget uh, uh, issues. So if they had been allowed to continue running, how much more precise would this, uh, would this value be that, uh, uh, from, from the Brookhaven side? Um, if I remember correctly, it, uh, the, it would have achieved exactly the precision that, that we have now as the world average. So it would have gone, gone down um, by, um, what was it? Uh, I think the final experimental uncertainty alone was uh, six times 10 to the minus 10, and they could have gone down to around four okay, in the yeah, optimal yeah. case. Right, yes. right. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, okay, so that is just the situation here. And uh, let's also just look at the standard model history. So of course, it was also extremely important to uh, improve on the standard model precision. And this is just a plot which shows the standard model development was really stable over the past 20 years between Brookhaven and currently. And let me just say that, uh, as you may know, or probably know, there is also a huge standard model theory community, the so-called Muon G-2 initiative, uh, with many, many authors, more than 100 authors have signed this white paper, which uh, has published the result that is now the basis of this comparison between theory and experiment. So that is the history. And now let me finally come uh, to the first serious part of the lecture, 
namely the definition and uh, some important formulas on G minus two. Let us first define G minus two as an observable. Of course, it's a very simple observable. You put a muon or electron into a homogeneous magnetic field, and then two things happen. On the one hand, you get a circular motion, and the circular motion is governed by this high school physics formula, omega is equal to E over M times B. And on the other hand, you get a spin precession, and the spin precession frequency is governed by this effective Hamiltonian that you see here at the top of the slide. Uh, with a B dot S term with a certain prefactor in this particular normalization using that uh, G is equal to two times one plus A mu. And then you can uh, see that the spin precession frequency coming from this uh, gets a very similar formula E over M times B times this uh, one plus A mu. And so what is really interesting is that the difference between those two frequencies between the spin and the orbital motion is directly sensitive and proportional to A mu to G minus two to the anomaly. So if you look at the picture on the right, this is what you see then typically from the experimental talks. You can imagine the situation, you uh, put a muon into the storage ring into this homogeneous magnetic field and it uh, orbits around. And in some case, the spin might be aligned in parallel to the motion initially. And if G were exactly equal to two, then the spin would always remain aligned with the velocity. But if G is bigger than two, then the spin precesses a little bit faster and you get this interference between the two associated frequencies. And that is what is directly measured in the experiment. Now in quantum field theory, this is described as follows. So you have Feynman diagrams, which describe the interaction between the muon and the electromagnetic field or the photon terms of such three point functions. And uh, in quantum field theory, you can then do a covariant decomposition or write the result in terms of uh, some quantities. You get a term proportional to the gamma mu matrix and another term proportional to the sigma mu nu matrix and the sigma mu nu corresponds to the spin of the muon. Okay, and then this gamma mu term is exactly the term which you also get from the normal Dirac equation without quantum field theory. And this term gives rise to G equal to two exactly. And the other term uh, is something that you do not have at tree level or in the Dirac equation, but it is generated from loop effects like the loop that you see here in this Feynman diagram. And so these loop effects, then we can say it generate an effective operator with this sigma mu nu matrix and uh, this operator uh, or its coefficient um, is then directly related to G minus two. So let me rewrite this in a few different ways to connect it to as many different people as possible. So one way to um, rewrite it is you can do a non-relativistic limit then you get a Pauli equation for a two component non-relativistic uh, Pauli spinos psi. And then if you just do a, a calculation, um, then you get terms like uh, L dot B here in this formula. This comes from the gamma mu term and gives rise to, or it means um, the uh, angular momentum interaction with the magnetic field. So is uh, the G equal one term from um, normal uh, motion. Uh, which is also true in classical electrodynamics. And then you get this S dot B term with this coefficient one plus A mu, which uh, is the G minus two. Uh, and in fact, the G equal to uh, plus A mu term. Okay. Another way to rewrite it and to extend it is given here. So in fact, there is not only the magnetic moment, but also the electric dipole moment. And so you can write uh, an effective Hamiltonian, which contains both the B dot S term and an E dot S term. And the E dot S term is then an electric dipole moment. Electric dipole moments are very interesting because they are CP and parity and T violating observables have not been observed so far for elementary particles, but hypothetically they can be non-zero and uh, they are of course very strongly related to G minus two. And in fact, um, if you uh, do the covariant decomposition of the Feynman diagram in a slightly more general way, then you could say you have uh, the sigma mu nu term 
times a real coefficient. This would give g minus two and times gamma five times an imaginary coefficient. And that would then give the electric dipole moment. So in that way, you can combine both dipole moments in one effective um, uh, structure. Okay, yet another way, and maybe the best way, and uh, the final way I would like to, you to keep in mind is to write all of this in terms of effective Lagrangians. And here is the full effective Lagrangian, which is um, describing G minus two and also the electric dipole moment of such fermions like the muon or the electron. So this effective Lagrangian uh, has a certain normalization and it contains here uh, the spinors of the muon psi bar sigma mu nu psi times the field strength tensor F mu nu. And you have a coefficient C, which may be complex. And uh, so you have to distinguish between the left-handed and the right-handed muon. Uh, the whole sum here that you see is real or Hermitian as an operator. And then the real part of this coefficient C in this normalization times two times the muon mass gives A mu. And the imaginary part of that coefficient in this normalization gives you the electric dipole moment. So that is really the procedure to calculate G minus two. You need to calculate Feynman diagrams, match them to such an effective Lagrangian, and then you can read off all of those dipole moments directly. Here is the proof. Oh, it's a little bit small, but uh, maybe depending on uh, your interest, we can go through the proof. For me, it was very nice to do this uh, because it allowed me to really match all the conventions of all the lectures and all the talks that I ever gave in the past. In fact, as is often the case, you cannot look at two different papers on this subject and find equal conventions. Either papers don't specify the definitions or they make mistakes or they are incompatible and so on. So I try to do my best to have here an error-free formula. You can check it later yourself. But anyway, uh, we can look uh, at how uh, you can take the non-relativistic limit and derive from this precise effective Lagrangian the Pauli equation that I had before. So here uh, you start with Maxwell's Lagrangian, which gives rise to the usual Maxwell equations. Then you have the Dirac Lagrangian, which gives the Dirac equation. And you can write the Dirac-Lagrangian in two ways. One way by explicitly exhibiting the appearance of the electromagnetic current given here on the right. And in a second way, by using the covariant derivative, the gauge covariant derivative, which is also given here on the right. And then you can combine the Dirac-Lagrangian with this effective Lagrangian and obtain this um, object here. And then from this, we have to take the non-relativistic limit to see what is the interpretation of all these different terms. So in order to do it, you need to plug in values of the gamma matrices, decompose uh, all the four component objects into three component objects, electromagnetic fields, E and B, and so on. Then uh, you get, uh, you can also decompose the four component Dirac spinor into two component Pauli spinors use quantum mechanics notation, and then the equation blows up, of course, dramatically. Um, but this is uh, standard stuff that you also do in quantum mechanics lectures. Then in order to take the non-relativistic limit, what you say is that the time uh, derivative of all these wave functions is uh, given by the energy, which is approximately equal to the rest mass of the particle. Then you see that here on the bottom right of this uh, two by two matrix, there appears minus i d by dt minus m. And this becomes approximately equal to minus two times the rest mass. And because of this, you can now eliminate one of the two Pauli spinors in terms of one over two m times the other spinor. And one over two m is then a small quantity. And you can systematically expand uh, the, uh, this equation in powers of one over m. And then if you take the leading term in this expansion, you obtain just an equation for this psi A for the upper uh, Pauli spinor. And um, this is the equation that you get. It looks very similar to the ordinary Schrodinger equation in non-relativistic quantum mechanics with a d by dt term, a rest mass term, a scalar potential term. And then here this uh, term which contains the kinetic energy plus covariant derivative 
and those extra terms with a, a coefficient c and they are mul multiplied with b dot sigma and e dot sigma. Okay, and then uh, there is a standard calculation uh, where you eliminate these Pauli matrices in favor of something which is a little bit nicer. Then uh, this term with the square brackets here is actually equal to uh, the, let's say, covariantly shifted uh, momentum square minus QE. Are you still connected? Okay, I will go on. Okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, long story short, you can write all this equation as a Schrodinger equation with an effective Hamiltonian. And this effective Hamiltonian is then given here at the last line. It contains the rest mass, the um, shifted momentum square over 2m, which is the non-relativistic uh, kinetic term that you have, uh, the scalar potential. And then a b dot s term with exactly this coefficient. The two comes, as I said, from the gamma mu term from the Dirac equation. And you get this minus 2m real part of c as an additional term coming from the effective Lagrangian. And you also get this extra term from the imaginary part of the coefficient, which is an EDN term. So it's a standard uh, way to derive this. And um, I hope I did all the conventions and the signs correctly. And so then you can now understand how uh, this uh, relativistic formulation of the effective Lagrangian is connected to the interpretation. And of course, from now on, this will allow us to, in quantum field theory, just uh, look at this level and we know what is the interpretation of the coefficients in this effective Lagrangian. Because this is what we can easily calculate using ordinary Feynman diagrams. Okay, now let me come to a brief review of the standard model prediction and the experiment. But I will be brief unless you uh, ask questions because I am sure you had dedicated talks on both topics uh, already. So the standard model is um, sometimes compared to the periodic table in chemistry, but I uh, claim that it's very, very different. It's much deeper and much, uh, um, let's say, uh, contains much more information. It describes all known interactions except for gravity. And it's a relativistic quantum field theory, which is renormalizable. And that has lots of implication. Uh, it means that we have these local interactions. We have Feynman diagrams with local vertices. We have dispersion relations, uh, and non-perturbative quantum field theory, and all these things follow. Uh, the standard model is based on gauge invariance, which uh, narrows down the possible interactions that we can have and uh, gives interrelations between all the different interactions between the particles. The standard model involves the concept of spontaneous electroweak symmetry breaking, which gives rise to the Higgs mechanism, the Higgs potential, and the Higgs boson. And again, uh, this mechanism implies specific relationships between the interactions and between the masses. And as you know, of course, all these non-trivial predictions and relationships are all confirmed in extremely many experiments. Okay. And at the same time, G minus two is a single number, which is sensitive to all particles, all generations and all interactions that we have in the standard model. And this sensitivity comes via quantum fluctuations. In other words, via these loop Feynman diagrams. And here is just the list of the um, results in the standard model. Um, zooming out a little bit, uh, because I'm sure you know the details, uh, QED contributes at the level 10 to the minus three weak interactions at the level 10 to the minus nine and uh, strong interactions or hadrons contribute at the level 10 to the minus seven. But everything is important. And uh, the um, evaluation of this is extremely difficult and you can write textbooks about all these different methods. In fact, uh, let's say all tricks and um, the full set of methods that we have available in quantum field theory is used here in order to get this high precision result. So in QED, uh, we need four and five loop Feynman diagrams, which are evaluated analytically, numerically. We have two loop electroweak calculations for the hadronic contributions. We use different non-perturbative techniques like unitarity plus causality giving rise to dispersion relations. Also lattice QCD is of course used 
and also uh, low energy hydronic models are also used in particular for those light by light contributions. So uh, this is known. Let me just highlight um, something which is interesting from the point of view of BSM. I stress that everything contributes. And so let me just mention that even the heaviest particles of the standard model contribute the top quark and the Higgs. So the top quark and the Higgs, they are part of the weak interaction contributions. They appear at the two loop level. And both of these particles contribute at the level of around 10 to the minus 10. So we are not exactly there yet, but uh, the current precision is four times 10 to the minus 10. But so even the top and the Higgs uh, matter at a relevant level. Let me show you two slides on the experiment. So the experimental principle is um, what I explained before. Uh, let me just mention two simple things. How can we uh, measure at all at the level 10 to the minus 10? How is it possible uh, to have such a high sensitivity and high precision? So two design advantages are important here. So first of all, as explained before, the experiment is directly sensitive to G minus two. So you do not have to measure G and then subtract two, but you immediately measure G minus two. And in this way, you gain three orders of magnitude in precision. Then uh, there is this magic gamma, the particular energy which is used for the muon. So the muon energy is around three GeV. And that three GeV energy means that uh, here in this um, equation, which, um, so this is a, a better equation than the one I had on the previous slide. So we, you have to go a little bit beyond high school physics in doing all this because there are relativistic corrections. And one relativistic correction to this precession frequency uh, involves the electric field. And the prefactor of the electric field contains G minus two again and the relativistic gamma. And by choosing this relativistic gamma of around 30 or 3 GeV energy, you um, make this term effectively vanish. And in this way, you minimize the influence of the electric field and um, uh, increase the precision of the measurement. So this is one of the design advantages with, which is used here. Then why is the experiment done at Fermilab? And why was it useful to transport the ring from Brookhaven to Fermilab? So the principal advantage is uh, the better infrastructure and the better muon beam. So very simply speaking, uh, the muons are coming from a pion beam and the pion uh, beam has a longer decay length. And because of that, more pions decay into muons. And in the end, in the ring, you have more muons and fewer pions, and therefore you have um, better beam and uh, better statistics and um, better systematics as well. So this is the simple reason. And then, of course, the experiment has done a great effort to um, obtain a very, very homogeneous magnetic field, more homogeneous than it was at Brookhaven. And of course, uh, the entire detector technology is much better than at Brookhaven because it's uh, 20, 30 years later and all the modern techniques are being used here in the experiment. So this is the status. We have um, the experimental measurement. We have the standard model prediction and the deviation is 4.2 sigma. And let us now finally come to physics beyond the standard model. As I said, I would like to start with a um, few motivational words and um, some general um, thoughts that you can keep in mind in the discussion of G minus two versus BSM before coming to more technical stuff. Okay, right. So let's begin again with this picture. We have seen the standard model um, uh, illustration here. And uh, as you know, the standard model cannot be the ultimate theory of nature. It uh, leaves open a number of relevant questions. And so one uh, obvious question is, what is the nature of dark matter? Cannot be explained within the standard model, but uh, it must be due to something different. And so what dark matter is, is one of the open questions for sure. Then by looking at this graph, uh, many, many questions arise immediately. So first of all, why do we have this pro proliferation of three generations of quarks and leptons? 
what is the origin of this number three generations? We don't know, but of course we would like to understand uh, the origin of this and the origin of flavor in general. Why are there quarks and leptons uh, in the first place? We don't know. On a technical level, I like to say that uh, the flavor quarks and leptons, they are described by the Yukawa three by three matrices. And so you can ask, what uh, is the origin of the Yukawa matrices? Why do they exist? What sets their values? Then uh, you can look at the Higgs sector and you see there are many quarks, many leptons, many gauge bosons, but just one single Higgs. Is that really all there is or are there several Higgs bosons? Or what sets the Mexican head structure of the Higgs potential? Where does it come from? Is there some fundamental dynamical origin of this Higgs potential? So what is the origin of electroweak symmetry breaking? This is of course one of the deep open questions of particle physics, which requires answers which go beyond the standard model. Okay, and uh, the list is not complete. As you know, there are many more interesting questions um, which point towards physics beyond the standard model, but for G minus two, I would argue that these particular questions in yellow here can be related to G minus two particularly well, and we will come back to all of those questions during the lectures um, again. This is a slide which I showed already 15 years ago in talks. And um, so this is just here to illustrate that uh, maybe not so much has changed. So 15 years ago, before the startup of the LHC, we were kind of uh, really motivated and looked forward to the LHC era in particle physics because we had so many motivations which pointed us towards spectacular discoveries of new physics at the TEV scale. So again, electroweak symmetry breaking, electroweak naturalness uh, pointed towards TV scale new physics, dark matter pointed towards WIMPs, which might have TV scale masses, grand unification pointed towards TV scale supersymmetry, and so on and so forth. So uh, we really said, uh, okay, it's very promising to expect new physics at the LHC and also maybe WIMP discoveries in dark matter direct detection experiments. Uh, needless to say, this has not happened yet, can still happen, but uh, at least so far um, we have neither seen new particles at the LHC, uh, at least beyond the Higgs, and nor WIMPs at dark matter experiments, so um, we can ask, are we actually on the right track? I don't know, but um, for sure it means that we have very, very strong constraints on new physics models because of those non-observations. And so that of course means that uh, in explanations of the G minus two deviation, we have to keep in mind that in all the other experiments, we have not found new physics beyond the standard model. But of course it also means that if this G minus two deviation turns out to be real, uh, and uh, if we prove the existence of BSM physics in G minus two, it would definitely be a breakthrough in particular, um, because as we will see later, G minus two can really uh, essentially only be explained if the new physics particles are not too heavy. And we will see what uh, not too heavy means uh, more exactly. So let us now really come to G minus two and BSM physics. Zooming out a little bit, we can start by saying what is now the result. The result is that the standard model prediction is lower than the experiment by 25 plus minus six times 10 to the minus 10. So this is the order of magnitude that you should keep in mind. And uh, the first question that you should ask uh, in looking at this number is, is it a large or a small number? And uh, it looks small at first glance, but I want to argue that it's actually a large effect why is it large? Um, okay, let, uh, okay, sorry, uh, too quick. Uh, let's first write down the questions that I want to discuss. So obviously, which models can explain the number? And uh, why is this single number so interesting? How can we talk three times one hour about one number? And uh, sometimes people ask, why are you so happy about the discrepancy? Uh, we will come back to those questions. And uh, uh, as you know, many, many papers have already been written about it. In this talk, I will often refer to our own paper, but not only. Okay, so the number is a large number. Why do I say it's a large? Because it's twice as large as the standard model weak contributions. 
uh, as you might have seen uh, on the previous slides, the standard model weak effects are 15 times 10 to the minus 10, and the deviation is 25 times 10 to the minus 10. So it's larger than this, but on the other hand, um, clearly from quantum field theory, you expect that the new physics contribution are suppressed by the square of the new physics masses. And so uh, typically you would expect the new physics contributes uh, to a smaller extent than the standard model weak contributions, unless you have some specific enhanced couplings in the new physics model. And that is actually what we need to have. So this is what you see in this way. So uh, this comparison makes clear that it's not automatically easy or trivial to come up with new physics scenarios which explain the G minus two deviation. In particular, given that we have not seen new physics elsewhere, okay. Now the second important point I would like to um, mention is uh, that G minus two has four specific properties which are kind of unique in this combination in the G minus two observable. Namely G minus two is loop induced, CP and flavor conserving and chirality flipping. So, and um, that shows really that G minus two is complementary to essentially all the other well-known observables that we have in particle physics. So very clearly loop induced means that we are sensitive to quantum fluctuations and uh, uh, we do not need to produce new particles directly and to be able to detect them with particle detectors. CP and flavor conserving means that uh, G minus two behaves very differently from other observables like electric dipole moments, which are CP violating or flavor violating processes like mu to E gamma or B to S gamma and so on. And the chirality flips are particularly important and we will come back to those later, but this is for example, a difference to electroweak precision observables. And so all of these complementarities can give you hints how it can be possible that uh, BSM physics can contribute large amounts to G minus two, larger than the standard model weak effects uh, without running into conflict to experimental data elsewhere. And at the same time, it also shows you that in order to come up with explanations of G minus two, you kind of have to exploit those complementarities. So you, we will be able to find explanations, of course, but in each of those explanations, you will need to go to specific parameter regions, which maximize those complementarities, which maximize uh, the CP conserving or flavor conserving nature and uh, the chirality flipping nature of G minus two and so on. So this will be seen in all the concrete examples we will look at later. Let me give you a pictorial overview of what we can expect from the concrete models. So I would like to highlight now this connection to the questions that were raised before. So first, how is G minus two connected to dark matter? Well, that's kind of obvious because uh, we need large effects and um, which are not uh, in conflict to, for example, LHC data. So dark matter particles can exist and by definition, they are hard to see in detectors. But if you imagine that dark matter particles may couple to the muon, then of course dark matter could really affect uh, via quantum fluctuations, the G minus two, and uh, they are not seen elsewhere. And uh, therefore it's quite natural to explain the G minus two result using dark matter particles. And in fact, that is really possible. You can see it in concrete models. And in fact, out of the 70 or 100 papers from the last weeks, uh, around 20 of them explain G minus two using dark matter particles. The other connection is um, that G minus two is related to uh, the muon mass generation mechanism. And that is a little bit deeper and more complicated. So let me explain this in a little bit more detail. So you can say uh, it's a window to the muon mass generation mechanism. And by this, I do not only mean the Higgs mechanism, but I really mean both the Higgs and the Yukawa sector because the muon mass comes from the combination of the Higgs and Yukawa sector. So why is this? So um, pictorially speaking, you see here again, this graph um, illustrating that G minus two corresponds to this relative rotation between the spin axis and the velocity. Okay, and such a continuous spin rotation is only possible for particles which have a rest mass and a rest frame. So in the rest frame, you would just have the spin rotation 
and nothing else. Imagine on the contrary, a photon or a massless particle. A photon um, can only move at the speed of light. It doesn't have a rest frame. And the spin of the photon is its helicity. It can only point either forward or backward. The photon spin can never have an angle compared to the velocity. Therefore, in order for G minus two to make sense at all as a quantity, you need a particle with a rest mass. And so in this way, you can see that G minus two is strongly related to the rest mass of the respective particle. And so now, of course, we know that in the standard model, the rest mass of the muon arises in a very, very complicated way. It arises from the Higgs and Yukawa sector. So first of all, you need a Higgs vacuum expectation value uh, coming from a complicated Higgs potential, which has a Mexican head shape. And of course, it's an open question where this Mexican head structure comes from. And then uh, the vacuum is filled with a Higgs expectation value, um, which is constant everywhere. And then the muon can couple to this expectation value via the Yukawa coupling. And uh, this combination uh, then gives rise to the muon rest mass. Okay, and so uh, there are open questions connected to everything here. And if you imagine some new physics scenarios, which change the Higgs sector, change the Higgs potential, or change the Yukawa couplings and so on, then they would change the mass generation mechanism for the muon. And indirectly, this will typically lead to strong corrections also to G minus two because of this connection of G minus two and the rest mass. Okay, and very often it happens that such models give uh, very strongly enhanced contributions to G minus two. And uh, therefore such models provide very uh, promising explanations of the G minus two value. On the other hand, different models uh, give different contributions to G minus two. Therefore the measurement of G minus two provides a very promising probe of uh, such um, extensions of the standard model which tell us something about the muon mass generation mechanism. So this is one of the interesting relations that I would like to point out. Let me now go to a more technical level and describe these chirality flips, what we have just seen in the picture in a little bit more technical way. So we will start by looking at the fermion masses versus chirality and gauge invariance, in fact, and then uh, look at G minus two versus chirality and gauge invariance, and then derive some consequences from this. So let's start slowly. Here is a fermion mass term that you know um, from the Dirac equation, for example, m times psi bar psi. And so actually, uh, it's not always written like this, but uh, psi bar psi means that you have a connection between a right-handed fermion and a left-handed barred fermion, or vice versa. And so let's now analyze this mass term. First of all, if you look at QED only, then this mass term is of course gauge invariant um, because um, yeah, it's obvious. But in the SU2 um, cross U1 gauge theory for electroweak interactions, uh, things change. So the left-handed muon is now part of a left-handed SU2 doublet. The right-handed muon is an SU2 singlet, and therefore um, the mass term for such a fermion or the muon is not invariant under electroweak gauge transformations. So this is a big uh, difficulty. And in the standard model, the muon mass is therefore generated in this way by coupling uh, the muon to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. So first of all, you need to introduce a Higgs doublet, phi, which in the vacuum has a non-zero expectation value. Um, by convention, the expectation value is in the lower doublet component. And then we can write down a gauge invariant term, which is the Yukawa term, which looks like this here, L bar times phi times psi, right? This is gauge invariant because we have two doublets and one singlet. And it also is invariant under U1 hypercharge gauge transformations. But once you plug in the expectation value for the Higgs field, you get a mass term which only involves the left-handed uh, muon and the right-handed muon. And the mass term then is proportional, of course, to the vacuum expectation value of the Higgs. So this is of course known to you, and it means that the um, muon mass in the standard model is directly proportional to the Higgs boson vacuum expectation value. 
But in fact, this is not only true in the standard model, it's true in any uh, gauge theory which has electroweak gauge invariants, no matter how complicated the extension might be. You will always need to introduce the muon mass by having some Higgs vacuum expectation value, which is responsible for electroweak symmetry breaking, and then the muon mass will inevitably be proportional to that uh, vacuum expectation value of whatever Higgs you might have in your theory. Can be the standard model Higgs or something else. So this is the first thing. Now chirality. You can define a chiral symmetry, which is defined by uh, rotating with a phase the left or right-handed muon only. For example, you can say you rotate only the right-handed muon with a phase, e to the i alpha, and the left-handed is invariant. And then you see that this um, term is, of course, not invariant under such chiral transformations because the left-handed doesn't transform while the right-handed transforms. So the muon mass also breaks such a chiral symmetry. And um, so how can it then be generated in the standard model? Well, uh, in the standard model or in any theory, you need uh, some breaking of this chiral symmetry. And in the standard model, again, the Yukawa term is the single breaking term um, of such a chiral symmetry. So the term that we had on the previous slide breaks this chiral symmetry. And the parameter, if you want the order parameter of this symmetry breaking, is the Yukawa coupling. And for this reason, it's clear that the uh, mass of the muon is proportional to the Yukawa coupling as well, because this is responsible for chiral symmetry breaking. And in fact, the tree level, the muon mass is just the product of both quantities, Yukawa coupling and WEF. But because we are arguing here with symmetries, uh, the statement is not only true at tree level, but at all orders. And in fact, at all orders in the standard model, the muon mass will be proportional to Yukawa coupling times the WEF times some other stuff. Okay. And again, the same is true in any extension of the standard model. You always uh, have chiral symmetry and uh, electroweak gauge invariants. And you, um, both of them are broken by the muon mass term. So in any theory, BSM or SM, you need a Higgs vacuum expectation value and some parameter which breaks this chiral symmetry. And then the muon mass will inevitably be proportional to the product of those two parameters which are responsible for the two symmetry breakings. And the parameters which break chiral symmetry are often Yukawa couplings, but not necessarily. They can also be different couplings which break chiral symmetry in a more complicated way, and we will see examples of that. But anyway, the general picture that I want to explain is this one. Now, Exactly the same argument is true for the G minus two. So here is the effective Lagrangian for G minus two again. And you see it also involves a connection between the left and right-handed muon. Uh, the sigma mu nu between doesn't really matter for this argument. So this uh, term breaks electroweak gauge invariance in the same way, and it breaks chiral symmetry in the same way as the muon mass. And therefore, the same is true. So in order to write down a gauge invariant operator, which gives rise to G minus two in an electroweak theory, you need a left-handed doublet, a right-handed singlet, and one Higgs doublet expectation value. Can be the standard model Higgs or some BSM Higgs, we don't know, but anyway, you need such a structure in order to get a non-zero G minus two. Okay, and therefore, uh, in summary of everything I said, you can now write down this um, complicated, um, let's say, combination of factors for any contribution to G minus two in the standard model or beyond. So, um, first of all, uh, G minus two is given by that coefficient times the muon mass. Therefore, the definition of G minus two involves one explicit factor of the muon mass, M mu, which has nothing to do with our current discussion. But then the coefficient C here um, is affected by our discussion. So the coefficient needs one factor of a Higgs vacuum expectation value and one factor of a chirality flipping parameter, whatever it may be. And then on top of that, you might have all sorts of other couplings. And for dimensional reasons, you must have a mass square in the denominator. So this is really the structure. And as I said repeatedly, this structure is true in the full standard model in particular. Uh, the weak contributions, and it's true in any 
BSM theory. And that can now be compared to the muon mass in the standard model or beyond. And in the muon mass uh, standard model, you have the standard model Higgs weft times the standard model Yukawa coupling. And uh, this is what we can now compare. So this is one of the most important formulas of the lecture. Serious maybe even, so it's uh, as simple as it might, may look, but this is really a very important guiding principle for all of our later discussions of explicit models. So I would like you to keep this in mind and let's draw some conclusions from this. So first, uh, this is when I say uh, G minus two provides a window to the muon mass generation mechanism. That is what I have in mind. Okay, so here it's obvious. Um, uh, you see these green factors uh, corresponding to breaking of electro weak age invariance and chiral symmetry. They are the ones responsible for both G minus two and the muon mass. And those factors are the ones which are of interest when we think of extensions of the standard model, which change the Higgs sector or change the Yukawa sector. And from those green factors, we might get really strong enhancements. And we will, of course, see examples of that later. Then a uh, second way of looking at the same thing is uh, the following here. So uh, as I said, uh, we can do this analysis for the muon mass and for G minus two. And uh, so lumping all these green factors into a quantity C BSM, you could say uh, that any BSM theory will give rise to relative corrections to the muon mass delta mu over mu, which is given by this uh, C BSM, which encapsulates all this green stuff. Then um, because of this argument, you see that then G minus two in the same model will be given by uh, order one times this very same C BSM factor times muon mass square divided by BSM masses square. So you have this very general relationship, which is essentially true in whatever model you look at. Uh, the model dependence is uh, what is the value of this uh, C BSM. It could be one, it could be smaller than one, bigger than one, whatever it can be. It can be loop suppressed, it can be uh, proportional to the muon mass itself or not. It can depend on all details of the BSM model, but you always have this relationship between contributions to the mass and contributions to G minus two. And so if you fix a BSM scenario, then uh, this also makes clear that you always have this one over M square suppression from heavy masses of the new physics scenario. And um, yeah, so this is important for phenomenology as well. May I ask a question? Yeah, Robert? of course. I mean, this one factor uh, of the muon mass, this comes directly from this uh, coefficient C as you had explained. Right. And, but this uh, other factor of the muon mass, I mean, sometimes people argue that this could be this second factor does not necessarily have to be in the muon mass. This could also possibly in a BSM model also be a different parameter. So mm -hmm. how general is, is, is this uh, yes. form here? Right, very good question. And I think uh, we should probably come back to this when we discuss concrete models, because I will give different examples, which also uh, illustrate what you say. Um, I mean, you know it, of course, but uh, maybe for everybody, let's say lepto quarks are an example of models where you have only this single factor of the muon mass and uh, nevertheless, uh, what I uh, said remains true. So even in such models, you can write uh, down um, these two formulas, but um, it can happen, for example, that this uh, CBSM, as I call it here, might formally be of the order one over the muon mass. So that would then be the case in such models. But what that means and uh, what how this influences the phenomenology of such models, uh, we can probably best discuss in the context of concrete examples. But it's true uh, that in some models, you do not get an explicit factor of mu square from the Feynman diagrams, but you only get an explicit mu to the first power from the Feynman diagrams. And then you need to discuss what is um, uh, how, how this is related to these formulas. But nevertheless, on this level, um, this formula is general. And it's true even in the models that you are referring to. In fact, I think on the next slide, uh, this will become clearer, but let me first draw this third conclusion here, um, which we can see here. 
So one argument that you can now put in place is the following. So you, you see here that each BSM scenario gives uh, relative corrections to the muon mass, um, the CBSM, and you might argue, okay, I think it's unnatural if the relative corrections to the muon mass are bigger than one. If you think this way, then you could impose a criterion that the CBSM should not be uh, bigger than one or approximately bigger than one. Then uh, this has an implication on G minus two. So then you would have for G minus two order one times muon mass square divided by MBSM square as the largest conceivable contribution. Again, this would be true even in leptoquark models and so on. So if you impose this uh, kind of fine tuning criterion for the muon mass, then you can only explain G minus two uh, if the new physics mass scale is below two TeV. And that is of course extremely interesting and important because it means that uh, the G minus two explanations are in the reach of LHC. Maybe not easily observable, but um, at least uh, the energy and the mass scale is in reach of the LHC. If you impose that fine tuning criterion on the muon mass. Okay, um, please let me know um, how how much more we can discuss, but maybe we can look at uh, this slide here in a little bit of detail because this also illustrates Georg's question. Um, so here are some explicit formulas, one loop formulas uh, from um, let's say generic BSM uh, or SM models. So this is a Feynman diagram where you have a one loop effect. You have a muon coupling to some fermion and some scalar particle. And the coupling constants in the Feynman diagram are just called CL and CR for the left and right handed parts of the couplings. And so then you see from the formula, uh, first of all, you see immediately that the loop contributions to the muon mass and to G minus two are very similar in structure. So this explains um, or illustrates what we have said before. In both cases, there are terms which involve squares of couplings, CL square, CR square times a loop function, and uh, terms which involve CL times CR times another loop function. And now, um, when I said on the previous slide here, CBSM and order of CBSM, you can see now exactly what this means. So this uh, CBSM would be the prefactor of the muon mass here in the first line. And order of CBSM would be the prefactor of the muon mass in the second line. And you see that essentially the coupling structures are the same. What is different is the loop factors and the loop factors are typically of the order one. They are normalized to be of the order one and so, but they are not exactly one. And therefore you get order one differences between the first and second line. Okay, but the detailed structure and the interesting new physics um, um, properties, the interesting dynamics of the BSM is of course encapsulated in the coupling structures. And this is really identical for the muon mass and uh, the muon G minus two. So these two formulas illustrate what we had on the previous slide. And so, for example, you can now see there are obviously two different kinds of terms. There are the square terms and um, the CLCR terms. And in the case of the square terms, you have an explicit factor of the muon mass. And in G minus two, you have an explicit factor of mu square. This is what Georg was alluding to. And on the other hand, there are the other terms which do not explicitly involve the muon mass or in G minus two, they only involve muon mass to the first power times another fermion mass. And so uh, you see now what Georg was thinking of. And um, indeed, uh, the second term here in both lines is the one which is of particular interest to us because this is the one which can involve these interesting chirality flips. Okay. And uh, so let me now, um, maybe if we have uh, a few minutes, uh, explain just this and then we could come to an end of the lecture. Um, so let's look at all these terms individually. So first let's look at this uh, square term CLCR square. They have a very simple behavior and uh, diagrammatically, they just mean that the muon chirality is flipped at the external line of the muon uh, here. So the muon would uh, fly along and then it would couple to the standard model Higgs 
uh, with a standard model Yukawa coupling turned into a left-handed muon, and then we just have a loop from BSM particles where, which involve only the left-handed muon. So this would immediately explain to you the term which involves CL square times an explicit factor of the muon mass, and this explicit muon mass comes from this external line chirality flip. On the other hand, uh, the CLCR terms, they are more interesting and uh, let's say uh, less trivial. Here the chirality is flipped in the BSM part of the Feynman diagram. So the diagram would be like this, uh, right-handed muon comes along and then it does a right-handed coupling to the BSM particles that gives rise to a factor of CR in the formula. Then in the BSM part of the Feynman diagram, we get a chirality flip and a coupling to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. And that may be a BSM Higgs and a BSM coupling of some BSM particles to the Higgs. And then eventually the BSM particles coupled to the left-handed muon via the coupling CL. And so this explains why we get a combination CL times CR. And it also explains why we get an appearance of the BSM fermion mass MF because that appears in the numerator of this uh, propagator here in the Feynman diagram. Um, but now uh, the point is the whole diagram breaks electroweak gauge invariance and it breaks this uh, muon chiral symmetry. So somehow the parameters which govern uh, these couplings here of the BSM particles to the Higgs and the BSM particles to the muon. So the combination of all these couplings must break this muon chiral symmetry that we have had on the previous slide. So very, very often those couplings in the BSM theory themselves are kind of um, responsible for the muon mass or related to the muon mass because they break this chiral symmetry. And in many models, it turns out that this combination of factors, namely the fermion mass and CL and CR, overall is proportional to the muon Yukawa coupling or eventually to the muon mass. It's not always true, but very often it is true. And then uh, this entire combination of factors, MF times the couplings, is somehow proportional to the muon mass. But it doesn't have to be equal to the muon mass. And so in this way, you can imagine that you can get easily some enhancements compared to the actual muon mass. Anyway, uh, you can always clearly see that the combination of couplings CL times CR, if both couplings simultaneously are non-zero, then uh, first of all, it means that the BSM particles can couple both to the left-handed muon and to the right-handed muon, but the left and right-handed muons have different gauge quantum numbers. So that means the BSM particles, how can they couple to two fields with different gauge quantum numbers that is only possible if the BSM fields themselves are not gauge eigenstates, but somehow mixtures. And so this is what always happens. And therefore, in all models where uh, you get terms like this in the formulas, um, you have typically mixing angles involved and mixing between left and right-handed BSM states. And uh, the discussion of those terms is typically very complicated. And this formula that we have here is very often misleading. And often the actual behavior is not just linear in the BSM fermion mass, but um, it is somehow um, combined to an effective dependence on the muon mass, maybe times some model dependent enhancement factors. So okay, this discussion is quite abstract, but uh, all I say will be realized in complete uh, concrete models. And we will look at examples later. Okay, maybe this is a good point to end the lecture. Uh, we can uh, skip this slide. This is just an overview of models where you see that uh, classifying according to this uh, CBSM that I introduced before, there are models with order one, order alpha, uh, order alpha square and much, much smaller contributions. And I would just say that we start with this in the next lecture. So let me instead summarize today's lecture and then come to a conclusion. So uh, in the style of the Wes Becker book, I thought let's uh, keep in mind uh, the four most important formulas from today's lecture, which is this. 
So the standard model prediction is too low by 25 plus minus 6 times 10 to the minus 10. Then you should keep in mind the effective Lagrangian, which is a dimension 5 effective Lagrangian, which contains a chirality flip and breaks electroweak H invariance. And G minus 2 is then related to the coefficient uh, with an explicit muon mass factor. Then uh, we have uh, from the discussion of chirality flips this um, complicated arrangement of factors in any contribution to G minus 2. And here again, the two one loop formulas which illustrate the range of possibilities for explicit models and we will come back to this. So here is now uh, the conceptual or physics summary of today's lecture. So the discrepancy is a large, um, large discrepancy. It's almost twice as large as the standard model weak contributions. But uh, we see that uh, in general, we get a mass square suppression. And therefore, we need tricky behaviors from BSM models in order to be able to produce such a large effect without running into conflict with experimental data elsewhere. There are these four distinctive properties of G minus two, loop induced, CPN flavor conserving, and chirality flipping. And the lesson uh, that I would draw from this is that kind of in, a, in order to have a viable explanation, you need to go to parameter spaces and models which uh, maximize these complementarities. So non completely generic parameter regions in generic models will not be able to do it. They will be excluded or give rise to small g minus two. But specific parameter regions in specific models can explain g minus two in a viable way. And this, uh, gives answers to those questions here. So which models can explain it? Some models can do it. Many models cannot do it. And uh, this is obviously why this single number is so interesting and why you can talk endlessly and for years and months and decades about uh, G minus two in BSM physics. Um, because if it turns out to be a real discrepancy and if the number stays what it is, um, it singles out really just a few models and um, particular parameter spaces in those models. And that obviously makes us happy because we can make really great progress in particle physics. And the outlook for the next lectures is of course that we will look at concrete models, but not only we will also look at uh, general relationships. For example, what is this uh, relationship to flavor physics? What is the relationship to CP violation? And what is the relationship to dark matter? We will look at all of this in more detail. And so I'm happy and thank for your attention and look forward to the other two lectures. So thanks a lot. Let me stop here. Thank you very, very much, Dominic. Your lecture make, makes us happy. So that's wonderful. <laughs> very good overview. Thanks a lot. And we have still time for questions. Please. Hands up or just start? That's also fine. Uh, so I have a question. Daniel, go ahead. Yes. Lovely. So um, when you were talking about the um, the BSM contributions to the uh, to AMU, you said something like uh, that every BSM extension which respects gauge invariance also needs an additional vacuum expectation value. Okay, uh, either the standard model Higgs wave or a new Higgs wave. So it, uh, the point yes. is. It doesn't have to be a BS, BSM Higgs, but uh, you need one Higgs vacuum expectation value, which breaks SU2 invariance in order to get a G minus two contribution. But let's say we introduce a fourth generation with vector like quarks, then they they don't need a VEF, I think. You can just write down a Dirac mass, which wouldn't be uh, violating uh, mm -hmm. the invariance, right? But they, they would still contribute to, to AMU, wouldn't they? Uh, they yeah, might contribute to a mu uh, vector like quarks. I'm not really sure how the Feynman diagram would look like, but vector like leptons definitely contribute to G minus two of the muon. But what I said was specifically to G minus two of the muon. So uh, even in those models, uh, you can write down a Dirac mass term, which is gauge invariant for the vector like additional leptons. But the muon itself uh, has no gauge invariant mass. So for the muon mass and for the muon G minus two, all of what I said applies still. And so oh. those additional Feynman diagrams where you have a muon coupling, for example, to a vector like lepton, let's do it with leptons, it's easier. Um, 
uh, then essentially uh, this thing would happen that I explained here. So you would have here a coupling of the right-handed muon, let's say, to a right-handed vector like lepton. Then that vector like lepton does its business and uh, eventually couples to the left-handed muon. So even there, um, ah, okay, uh, I don't know what you have ex exactly in mind. Maybe you have in mind that a vector like lepton could, um, there is a left-handed and right-handed vector like uh, muon and so it could couple without uh, having a coupling to the Higgs. Exactly. So we can write down the diagrams in detail, but I can tell you that if you have a cup, um, oh, let me back up. Um, I don't know whether everybody has in front of their minds the Lagrangian for vector like leptons, but let's recapitulate. So in that case, you would have uh, the following new fields. You would have, first of all, a vector like doublet which has a left and right-handed doublet part. And you would have a vector like singlet, again, left and right-handed singlet, okay? Now you can write down several diagrams. You might write down a diagram where you couple the right-handed muon to a left-handed vector like doublet or to a left-handed vector like singlet. So there are all these different possibilities now. And if you want, a contribution which is chirally enhanced, which makes use of those CLCR terms and makes use of the enhancement potentially with a vector like fermion mass in the numerator, then indeed uh, also in the case of vector like lepton models, you need uh, to write down the Feynman diagram in such a way that for instance, you couple the left hand, uh, the right-handed muon singlet to uh, left-handed vector-like fermion singlet, then the vector-like fermion singlet couples to the Higgs doublet VEF, turns into a vector-like doublet, and then the vector-like doublet couples to the uh, left-handed muon doublet in a gauge invariant way, and so on. So in this way, you also need to couple the vector-like lepton to a Higgs VEF in order to get an enhancement. There are parts of the Feynman diagrams for vector-like leptons which don't uh, introduce this coupling to the Higgs, and they would behave in this way. So then you would get a, a standard model Higgs wave times the muon yukawa coupling times some uh, innocent loop involving some vector-like stuff. But that vector-like loop is then not enhanced by anything. And uh, you would just get a contribution of the order muon mass times um, alpha over four pi uh, with a suppression of the vector-like lepton masses. But if you want this kind of contribution, you need also to couple the vector-like leptons to the Higgs wave. OK, I see. Thank you. Uh, in fact, uh, I might not have it on my slides yet, but maybe I will in two weeks from now so that we can look at those contributions in detail. Uh, anyway, I can say that uh, vector-like leptons behave very, very similarly to lepto quarks. And uh, vector quark, lepto quarks, I wanted to discuss definitely. And so then you can see. Uh, the discussion also in more pictorial terms, maybe. <laughs> Lovely. Further questions? Yes, I have a question. Um, I am not completely understanding what is wrong with this same diagram without a Higgs insertion. Without the Higgs? Sort of, yeah. Yes. What? What is wrong uh, is the left and right handed muon. That is wrong. So, if you don't have a coupling to the Higgs, effectively you cannot couple the left and the right handed muon in a gauge invariant way. So, you see, if you ignore the helicity indices in the diagram, then you are perfectly right. So, you can, could have a left handed muon uh, sure. doing the loop uh, like this. And uh, but, then. So th there are no extensions of the standard model in which you can have a particle just doing that without coupling to a, to an external Higgs. No, or no, Higgs no, no, there is no BSM scenario which could do that because this is just uh, the effective operators that you generate uh, with those Feynman diagrams. So um, you can write each Feynman diagram as a certain quantum field theory operator. And that quantum field theory operator will then, um, if let's say, you cut the diagram here, you just take the loop, forget about the external Higgs, then this loop would mean that uh, it corresponds to an operator 
of the form psi bar psi. This is an operator which mm -hmm. contains just two fermions, a barred fermion and an unbarred fermion, psi bar psi. And then you ask, is this operator gauge invariant? So you can only have gauge invariant results in the full theory. Ah, yes. And uh, then psi right bar times psi left is just not gauge invariant. So you cannot uh, get such a loop without effectively having a coupling to the Higgs. So, yeah, but okay. of course, just to make it clear, of course, in uh, uh, for a practitioner of quantum field theory, you often do not write these uh, Higgs couplings. You don't write this. I put this here uh, in a pictorial way so that you understand how effectively uh, the particles couple to the Higgs vacuum expectation value. But if you actually do the calculation as a practitioner, then these Higgs couplings are incorporated into parameters in the Lagrangian, into mixing matrices and so on and so forth. You don't see them anymore. And that is also why sometimes people uh, are a little bit confused about uh, this dependence on the Higgs. But eventually you are always able to trace back contributions of these kinds uh, uh, to, to see that actually in all these products of mixing angles and mass eigenstates that you have in your calculation, actually the contributions must be proportional to some Higgs vacuum expectation value. It is always like this. Thank you. Sometimes people call it a mass insertion mm. instead, of, uh, instead of thinking of the coupling to the Higgs. Right. But it's of course the same thing. Mm. Further questions, comments, ideas for Dominic? So the plan was that uh, probably next time in two weeks from now, I will focus.